Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Hallelujah. So now we arrive in this new chapter in our studies, the book of Romans. Um, chapter 12 is bringing us into a new section of Paul's writing, like it is his custom in his letters. He first gives us the theology then he gives us the practice of the theology. It is very important to understand that doctrine and practice and duties go together. We have seen from chapter one, the line of thought, the train of thought that Paul had. He explained to us the condition of man. He, con he explained to us how men gave themselves for the wrong use of their bodies, explains the wrath of God, shows that no one is righteous, there is not even one, that there is no way of how one can save himself. But he also then tells us that by faith, the kind of faith that Abraham exercised, one can be justified, then in fact we've been justified by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He shows us and tells us in chapter 6 why now we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are servants of God. He also explains that he himself has his own struggles in chapter 7 and in chapter 8. He speaks about the victory, the chapter of sanctification, the, the chapter that um, shows that the spirit of God and the spirit of man, the mind of man cannot agree, 
but in Christ we can overcome the desires of the flesh. Then suddenly he changes subject. And we have chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11 on a totally different theme which speaks about the promise of God to the people of Israel, the past, present, and future of the nation, but it also has in it the line of thought that we are all justified by faith. And then we go to chapter 12. But I need you to understand something. I need you to go back to chapter 8 for a minute and remember what we've been studying in that chapter and how that chapter ends with the beautiful promises that we have in Christ Jesus. Jesus Paul was convic convinced. He said, I am sure that Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers. Nothing of this time, nothing of the future. No power. No height, no depth. Nothing of this age can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now skip forward to chapter 12. And he comes with these words. I appeal to you therefore. The word therefore is a very important conjunction. It's connecting that, that line of thought that we have in chapter 8 where if God has done all these things for us, which means from chapter 1 up to chapter 8, all these things that God has done for us, then therefore, it's a Greek short word in the Greek un. It is used 48 times in this book. And because this chapter, this book of Romans is a very logical book, Paul gives his theory, his, his, his doctrine, in a logical way. And this is an easy way to understand. If one plus one equals two, then one plus one plus one equals three. You cannot go wrong there, right? You're the match teacher. So I, I made sure I don't get that wrong, you know. And this is the rationale behind Paul's thoughts. If God is doing and has done so many things for us, so the reasonable thing to do is that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. He starts the verse by saying, I appeal to you. I beseech you. I parakletos to you, which is a Greek word, which means I am emotionally asking you. In the mercies of God, that if you really believe what God has done for you, then what you need to do is present yourself as a living sacrifice to God. If you remember in chapter 1, we spoke about how man misuse his body. Now he is asking us to use our body for the glory of God. We find the wrath of God in chapter 1. Here we find the mercies of God. So as we read the book, we see this shift And this is the shift because if we believe in Jesus, if we believe in who he is, what he has done for us, if we realize this greatness, this salvation that he has given us, the reasonable thing to do is to offer ourselves 
as a living sacrifice to God. Now, when we speak about a living sacrifice, we need to have an idea of what we're talking about. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. We have Isaac. Isaac is an example of a living sacrifice. Why? Because he was about to be sacrificed by his father Abraham on an altar. And yet, after God saw the obedience of Abraham, God delivered Isaac. So we have a living sacrifice. What was happening there on Mount Moriah, the same mountain on which Jesus was sacrificed, we find Jesus who was killed on that same mountain, but then rose again. So we have now a living sacrifice. Not forgetting that now we, as servants of God, we that say we believe in Jesus, must also deny ourselves, deny our own pleasures, because we want God to be honored in our life. And therefore, Paul is saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, many times, many times we think that worship is when we sing our songs and we raise our hands and clap our hands and maybe dance a little bit. And we call that worship. You know, that means really nothing unless it's accompanied by a life of obedience to God. Unless we offer ourselves as holy to God. How do we do this? How are we going to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice? The first step is found in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renew renewal of your mind. This world is deceptive. Everywhere we look, we see deception. Every piece of news you hear on the popular news channels is deceptive. The pleasures of life are deceptive. What God says sin, calls sin, we call it pleasure. When God says self-control, somebody will come and say, but psychology says, you will be suppressing yourself, and you will not be able to live happy if you do that. And you know what? The truth is, the reality is, there is more people living in depression today in this liberty that we have than ever before. The only time that a person can live, can, can live in peace and with joy is when he serves God. Later on, we find in chapter 15, may the peace of God, peace and joy of God be with you. This is what you and I need, the peace and joy of God. And that peace and joy come to us when we are in the will of God. And to be in the will of God, we need to deny ourselves. Jesus said it himself. You want to be my disciples? And I'm sure we will say, yes, I want. Then you must deny yourself and follow me. Denying the self, that fleshy part of us, 
that seeks our pleasure and sometimes it's sinful pleasure that God hates so that we can live in holiness and in righteousness. The command is, do not be conformed to this world. We must make distinction between what is right and what is wrong. Especially in these days when there is these forces of change bombarding us from every angle. In a way that if we speak what we believe is right and good, if it doesn't agree with the political correctness of the age, then people will be prosecuted. People sent to prison. Right now, a German pastor was arrested just this week for speaking the truth, by preaching the truth. Most churches in Germany are like in the times of Hitler. They just want to please the government. That was the Lutheran church in those days, especially in the 30s and 40s. And yet, people like Bonhoeffer, because he spoke his mind, he was murdered by the Nazis. And this thing is happening again. And it keeps happening, especially as we come closer to the age of the end. The choice is difficult, but it is serious. Who are we going to serve? God or man? We already seen in chapter 6 that we cannot serve sin. And our governments and our rulers are trying to tell us that those are personal choices and we should not call them sin. And yet, God says different. That's why Christians need to rise up in these days. And I rise up not by demonstrating on breaking or burning buildings. We don't do those things. But by living righteous and showing that a man can be peaceful with himself, that a person can live with joy and happiness by living a holy life, Look at the world. Look at the fear that exists, especially with this pandemic, 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 pandemic. I will give you, it's a funny experience. I shared it with, with you during the prayers yesterday, some of you. As you know, I was in Gozo for a couple of weeks. And I was doing my exercise, my early, uh, early uh, you know, it was my exercise. It was in the afternoon, actually. And at one point, one day, I'm going through this road, and I see a man coming beh from behind a car and who was making like this. I thought a car was coming behind me. But I thought it can because this is a one-way road. So I looked back and there was no one. So I kept, you know, doing my jog. And this man was, you know, signaling this to me, I realized. When I got close to him, he hid behind the car and he said, by the way, I forgot to say, because of my heart condition, I have permission that I don't wear masks, okay? So I, when I'm doing my exercise, I don't wear masks, all right? So... You need to know this. So when I got to this man, he said, come on, pass, so I can cross the street. Last Thursday, in the same road, as I was walking, I see this old man with the mask saying, rrr, rrr, rrr. he had a stick in his hand, and he came to hit me, to try and hit me with the stick, because I had no mask. That's the fear that people are living in. Ridiculous. And yesterday I said, where on earth did he got, he got that piece of wood from? So I passed again. I saw a garage with a, you know, a bunch of sticks outside the door. So that's where he got his stick. He was waiting for me for a stick because I had no mask. 
Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because people who love God, people who trust God, do not have to live in fear. They can be careful in what they do. But fear is not of God. And that's why we do not conform with the patterns of this world. We've been talking about I don't want to keep repeating myself. We know there is an evil plan behind all this. And it shows us believers that the word of God is true and the coming of the Lord is near. When we read chapter 12, the first three verses, we realize that this kind of behavior shows our relationship with God. In fact, the next part of the passage, which we'll be discussing in more detail next Tuesday, speaks about the relationship that we have between us as a church, which is incredibly important. The third part of this passage speaks about our relationship with our enemies. Where Paul quotes scriptures used in the Old Testament, which in the Tanakh. You know, I'm trying to stop using the word Old Testament because as I, we already established now, if we have two-thirds of the Tanakh in the New Testament, you know, you can't call that old because the New is old as well since it has two-thirds two of it from the old. So, you know, the Bible is one book. So he's quoting from the Proverbs and from the Deuteronomy and the words of Jesus in the book of Matthew that we need to love our enemies and do good to our enemies. But how can we do that unless first we have a pristine relationship with God? Unless we learn to live as a church without being offended for every little thing. By learning to forgive one another and bear with one another, as he teaches in other books of the Bible and also in chapter 15 and so on. And then we have a relationship with our enemies. In chapter 13 speaks about the relationship the few ver the beginning verses, a relationship with our government. That will be an interesting chapter. Thank God I'm not, I'm not preaching it. Laura says. So by saying this, brothers and sisters, if we really want to live differently, if we really want to live in the grace of God, Verse 3 tells us, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment and according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Brothers and sisters, we need one another. Nobody is, no one is more important than the other in the body of Christ. We are all sinners saved by grace. Those who write on Facebook that they don't see that sinners are saved by grace are reading the Quran or something different. If they read the Bible, they have to see that we are sinners saved by grace. And God, in his sovereignty, wants to use each one of us to encourage one another, to build one another. And that is a humble understanding how much we need each other. And that's why God has given us different gifts, different talents. And every talent is important. Every gift is important. There is no gift more important than a other. We, all gifts are important. 
whether you're a finger, the nose, the ear, every single part of the body is important. And that is why last year we spent seven months teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. How every single gift that God has given the church is first to glorify God and then to build the church. When we don't use the gifts that has given us, we are like the person that was given the talent and hid them. I don't have the time to go there, but we all know this parable. We need to be one body, especially as we see these days, which are going to be difficult coming upon us. We've entered into the era of death is more important than life. And now, not the murderers are being punished, but those who speak for life. That's the upside down world that we have entered in the last few years. We've seen it happening before our eyes. So we must know how true the scripture is. And therefore, brothers and sisters, as I come to close today on this passage, obviously we will discuss it more deeply on, on Tuesday. I would like you to read this passage, pray about this passage, and ask God what you need to do, what his calling is, his perfect will for you to serve the body of Jesus. It's not about how comfortable we are. It's not about if it fits in my schedule or not. It's about what God wants. If God says something, he wants something from you. It's not God that has changed his schedule. It's you and it's me that needs to change our schedules. Because God has a plan. And God's plan is always good. Verse 4. I will close with this reading. For us, in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Praise the Lord. This is where we exercise love. This is where we exercise forbearing. This is where, where we show patience. And this is where we exercise the rest of the gifts that we have there. Whatever it is, whether it's preaching, whether it's giving, whether it's serving, whatever it is. You've studied all those gifts in detail. You have one or more of those gifts. And if you still come to church and sit down on a seat and you're not active in one way or the other, you're depri depriving the body of Christ from your service. Which, after all, it is not for the body. It's not for the one that has hair and the other one that has no hair. It's not about the one that's tall and the other is that's not so tall. It's about Jesus Christ, his body. So, brothers and sisters, think about these things. Pray about them and say, Lord, I want to serve you according to your will. Because I have been created for that purpose. Brothers and sisters, there is no time more important that th than these days. The chronos that we are living in is the time, it's an appointed time where evil is raising its head. The anger, the way the liberals Punish those who want to remain conservative. You can see it. And we know why this is happening. Because the devil knows that he has short time left. He knows. And that's why we can overcome him by the words of our testimony. 
we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb. By knowing that we are saved and made righteous by that blood. And no one will make us bow down to the system of this world. We renew our mind. We don't want to be part of this system. And we will suffer for that. The time is coming. And it's with us. When Jesus gave the revelation to John the Apostle, and he said, these things will happen soon. He used the Greek word entake, which means when they happen, they happen quickly. And see if this is true or not. It's like a bulldozer going through the fields, plowing everything that sees in front of it. That's what's happening today to our moral values. <laughs> if we don't hold on to them, who is going to hold on to them? We are the church. God trusted us with his message. Let us preach it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.